Um, so my name is Tracy Citroni, and I uh, live in Richmond, Virginia. I'm a sociologist, and I teach at the University of Mary Washington, and I've been involved with Immunized Virginia for, well, let's say, five, six, seven years, something like that. Yeah. So my experience with cervical cancer started in 1999. Uh well, I, actually, 1998 is when I started feeling symptoms, um, but I wasn't diagnosed until 1999. I was actually misdiagnosed for about six months. I was sent to physical therapy. And <clears throat> so when I finally got diagnosed in 1999, um, I ended up, uh, it was um, metastatic. It was um, a tumor in on the pelvic wall. Um, it had already spread. So, um, and that's where the main tumor was. I actually never had a primary tumor. Um, and so I went through surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation, both internal and external that year. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry to hear about that and that there was the misdiagnosis. I feel like that must have been so frustrating. Um, it was, yeah. I mean, I, I had just started my job at Mary Washington. It was my first year teaching there. And mm -hmm. I would, in such pain, I would go back from class and lie down on the floor of my office in pain, just crying because I was in having so much pain. Um, yeah, it was it was pretty hard. It was a hard time. Yeah, I, I can imagine. Um, and so at that point in time, there was no HPV vaccine. I had no idea what HPV was. I was complete, I was 30 years old and completely ignorant of everything that was happening. I mean, I had gotten my routine PAPs. Um, I had had years prior at an abnormal PAP when I was a grad student at the University of Pittsburgh. And um, as a consequence of that, uh, um, they um, they performed cryosurgery. And um, and since then, I had I had not had an abnormal PAP. And that's, I think, probably what contributed to the misdiagnosis because the, the normal signals weren't there. So I, I found out about Survivor. I first got involved with the uh, National Cervical Cancer Coalition, if you know what that is. I don't even know if they're still active. Maybe they're not. But anyway, I went to a meeting in 2013. That was actually the first time that I ever heard Tamika Felder speak. She was at she was uh, doing a session at that conference, um, and that was before uh, she had officially formed Survivor. I think because her, initially she started doing something called Tamika and Friends, so it was an earlier version of, of okay. Survivor. Um, but I ended up going to Survivor School in 2017. So it was like four years after that, I saw that there was an announcement um, about the Survivor School happening. And I just, you know, thought it would be a great idea to get involved. I mean, I hadn't, and, and that's why another reason I think Survivor is so important because it, and you see because of the social media presence, they are so incredibly media savvy, unlike me. Um, and uh, and so people find us like, you know, and, and that is that's amazing that, you know, people can find us and get that kind of support. Because when I went through cervical cancer almost 25 years ago, um, I didn't know anything, A, and I didn't know anybody. And no one, no one reached out to me. No, like there was just no one to talk to about cervical cancer specifically. I never met another person who had had cervical cancer until that conference in 2013. Wow. It was such a, it was such a moving experience. And so then from there, you know, getting involved, going to survivor school and meeting, not just, you know, a couple, but tons and tons of people who ha have, um, who, who have also experienced uh, cervical cancers, it, it makes a difference. And, and I see that in the, you know, I'm going to say younger people, um, but I see that in the younger people that have come to the organization at, at, the, at a time when they are going through the, the, the treatment and in the aftermath of the treatment, because, you know, it's not over when the, when the treatment right. ends. Um, you know, I'm still knocking on wood <laughs> almost 25 years later. And then there are the side effects from the treatment itself because it's so incredibly toxic. One um, sort of event that they do is called Survivor School. And so they you, you sign up to go to this sort of retreat and there's extensive education about HPV, about the vaccine, about screening um, and re really training and advocacy. Uh, it's a it's a fantastic organization. So, so well, uh, so well organized and, and so effective in what it what it does. Um, and so, yeah, as a consequence of that, I have um, hosted events here in Richmond and done things around advocacy, just trying to raise awareness, one about um 
HPV being the cause of cervical cancer uh, very often, and also um, just the way that routine screening and early detection can save lives, those things together, right? I mean, the fact that one thing I always enjoy talking about is the fact that cervical cancer is effectively preventable. Um, it's a preventable cancer, which is just earth shattering when you think mm -hmm. about it. Um, and so that's part of what fuels my, I mean, that in my experience, obviously, but fuels my passion for um, for advocacy around this issue and encouraging people to vaccinate their their children and to to get do those screenings so that they can avoid the really the horrors of uh, of this illness. Um, and I was lucky. I'm lucky to be here. I mean, that was, you know, nearly now almost 25 years ago this year. But here I am. So this is that's why I do what I do because and I see that I see people who are suffering and who haven't been as lucky. So I think it's my job to, to be here in addition to my job for pay. <laughs> Everyone, basically, this is a, everyone is likely to, to contract HPV at some point in time. And, you know, it, it's just sad that for those of us who can't clear the virus, mm -hmm. that's what this is. This is what can happen, you know, and some people just clear it. They never even know they had it and they go about, about their lives. But for those right. of us who can't clear the virus for Im, like immune uh, immune reasons, um, you know, yeah. you know what's, what should be stigmatizing about that? We get contact people in Survivor all the time from people who have, either they test positive for HPV. I once even had a colleague come into my office and, and, you know, and sadly, I mean, it's the stigma thing, right? Because mm -hmm. sadly she seemed a little, a little embarrassed to tell mm -hmm. me. And I thought, look at who you're talking to. I mean, yeah. I threw it all. So, you know, whatever. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think it's it, it, those. It, it can be so scary, but knowing that you have that added protection makes such a difference. And people across the gender spectrum um, can be affected. Yeah. Uh, there's so many aspects to tackle when you're talking about disparities in healthcare. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like because it, you know, it for some people it's still so new to think about a spectrum of gender that, mm -hmm. um, you know. But I worry. I worry about the people who don't go to get their screening because of how they'll be received. You know, if you have a cervix, it could be in danger, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, we need to create the structures and the practices that make that, make those visits, not just palatable, but yeah, safe. Affirming, good, yeah. Just, you know, like that they feel good, that there's yeah. some joy in being, like taking care of your body, right? Yeah. And so what we need to do is get, you know, obviously the vaccine, but then also to get people comfortable going to, to providers for the, the screenings too. Mm -hmm. And that has, that touches on a whole host of things I'm interested in in medical sociology, which have to do with why some people don't go and how they get treated when they get there, um, all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm really interested if you're able to talk about your, your research um, and if you've you know, if anything from your personal life has influenced your research? Uh, well, yeah, as um, so when I when I was diagnosed with cervical cancer and went through that whole treatment, I became very interested in illness narratives. Um, and so part of my work has been interviewing people um, about their illness experience. Um, and and also I have done a little bit of um, autoethnography. I don't know if you know what that is, but um, um, using my own story, but in a sociological sense to um, to, you know, as as data um, to talk about the social issues surrounding, um, in my case, the experience of cervical cancer. Yeah. That kind of work can be so useful because it puts into context individual stories. I mean, stories are impactful regardless, but I think especially for the lay public, it's hard to exercise sociological imagination, which I know you know as a, <laughs> a person who studied sociology, but making that analytic leap, right? Going from the fact that, okay, this is Tracy's story, but Tracy is this type of person in this these social groups and has had these experiences in these social contexts. And that's how we see patterns, mm -hmm. right? So we see um, what happens because of, you know, we talk about social inequality and the way that um, intersect intersecting inequalities cut across the, this kind of illness experience. Um, it, it's it's really impactful. Like it's, it's like 100% more impactful because you're seeing 
how structural changes like policy and, and, and other kinds of reforms can help to um, alleviate the illness burden in a population. I mean, look at, I mean, the fact that cervical cancer disproportionately impacts people of color. And e even when they are diagnosed and they have a, a higher chance of dying from the illness than, than, than white people. And you think about the fact that that, and, and the history of discrimination within biomedicine. I mean, if you just think of that whole history um, that, that, and, and, and the social determinants of health that position different groups of people in ways that are incredibly disadvantageous to their well-being and their health. I'm sure you've read uh, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Yeah. I used it in class once, a couple of semesters. Yeah, when it okay. first came. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, um, they actually had us read that in high school. And oh, then, wow. yeah. Um, yeah, and it was, it was impactful then, but then also it was required reading for uh, the job where I was doing the COVID interviews. Oh, and nice. it was even more impactful that time because I was kind of seeing these things play mm -hmm. out in real life. Um, and so, yeah, I you know, for I guess for people who don't know that story, it follows Henrietta Lacks, who was a, a black woman who was born in Virginia. Um, mm -hmm. At the time of the book, I believe she lived in Baltimore, Maryland. That's right, and, she went to Johns, Johns Hopkins, yeah. Right, and they, they took a sample of her cervical cells, mm -hmm. um, which turned out to be uh, cancerous. But um, sadly, she died and she left behind several children. Um, but those cells, without her knowledge and without her family's knowledge, were then used for probably some of the most important inventions that modern science knows of the to this day. Um, mm -hmm most most of the progress we've made is due to the way that her cells were able to replicate unlike other cells and her family has up until the publishing of that book i think had received no kind of either official or unofficial acknowledgement um or any kind of uh compensation really so mm -hmm. i think that's kind of um like that's at the root of all of this is that cervical cancer it it took her life and it continues to disproportionately impact black women so i know that survivor has done a lot of work on that like i i follow survivor on social media and oh, nice. uh -huh. a lot of the posts that are really informative mm -hmm. about those disparities yeah. Um, and yeah um i think Survivor has done a really good job of um, reaching out to a broad section of um, of women. Yeah, no, I agree. Absolutely. What would you say to a parent who is mm. hesitant or skeptical of HPV vaccination? Maybe they think that it will increase the odds of their child becoming sexually active. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say to them? Mm -hmm. Um, well, so I'm not a parent. Uh, when I, when I went through, uh, sort of treatment for cervical cancer, uh, I went through early menopause at 30. And, um, and so I, I don't know if I ever would have chosen to have children, but I do know that that choice was taken from me. Uh, and so one of the first things I think of the, when you, when you began to ask the question, I thought if I had a child, I would, I would do everything I possibly could to keep them from ever having cervical cancer, certainly, or any of the six cancers that HPV uh, can cause. This, this whole sort of stigma about, about sex and, and HPV, um, sometimes, and I don't have a figure to, to give you a statistic, but sometimes that, that those sexual um, uh, um, activities or no, behaviors mm -hmm. are not voluntary. Right. Yeah. So, so again, why would you not want to protect your child? Yeah. And that's not, that's not something that a parent wants to think about, but it, it happens. Mm, absolutely. And, um, absolutely. Yeah. You, yeah, I think that's a really great point. Um, mm -hmm. and also just thinking about the fact that, you know, the recommended age now is nine years old. Mm -hmm. Um, 
no one no one is okaying sexual activity for a nine-year-old no of that is not at all this, this is not a campaign to promote sex no, no absolutely not, not by any means it's yeah. instead and I think I've I've had this conversation with family members who um are a little bit unsure of mm -hmm. HPV vaccination um and the way I try to explain it is that the earlier the person gets the HPV vaccine, the more effective it's going to be. Mm -hmm. And so it's not a matter of saying your nine-year-old is now a sexual being. It's no. that if they get that vaccine at nine versus 11 or 12, their odds of being protected are higher That's than right. they would be. How an organization like Survivor um, really, it really brings um, the support and the, you know, I hate to say camaraderie because it sounds like, you know, a little too upbeat, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but it, but it, I, I see that it makes, it makes a real difference for people. And um, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, there's, there's nothing wrong with finding joy in shared suffering. I mean, <laughs> right? yeah. you know, like I, I think I've, I've found that in my own life um, mm -hmm. with, these um groups that I've been a part of there's one called the dinner party which is for people in their 20s and 30s who have lost um loved ones to cancer mm -hmm. and so um it's it's just been a really crucial kind of like peer support network and now mm -hmm. I have this group of friends who are across the country mm -hmm. um who have all been through the same exact or very similar things that I've been through and um it just it really does make a difference to have people mm -hmm. who get it and who can, you know, make dark jokes about, yep. <laughs> about all of the the hard things in life. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's 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 so um, it's affirming, right? Mm -hmm. um, to to have those connections and 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 also to because you don't you don't feel like you always have to explain yourself. Yeah. Right with other people when you're telling people your experience and sharing things, you know, some all, often there's just this puzzled look on their face, like, oh, oh, mm -hmm. oh. But with the people who've been through the same or a similar experience, there's just this this common ground that you start on, and it is, it's beautiful. It really mm -hmm. is. We can laugh together, we can cry together. Um, yeah, and it um it's it's good. You, you're getting, you're, you're, you're doing something good in the midst of this, as you say, this suffering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, I, I'm glad to hear that survivor has done that for you and I'm sure for a lot of other people. And, mm -hmm. um, I'm really grateful that it facilitated this conversation. Um, it is, you know, it's always a good reminder, um, that, the work that I do in, in my role with the coalition mm -hmm. is um, reaching people. And um, yeah, so. Absolutely, a pleasure. Yeah, and, 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 and you know, people like you and organizations like Immunize Virginia, like those are our partners, right? Mm -hmm. You know, what we do, you know, it's got, it's got its, you know, certain facets, but then those partners that we can reach out to and, and work with and form these alliances and just really be, to, to, to make this even more of a global movement. I mean, and it's a global, it's a global issue. And so that's, that study in Scotland is so instructive to everybody um, about how, how important it is and how, I mean, we really can eradicate cervical cancer. That's amazing.